On my last trip from Seattle to New York City, I asked my friend John Hall about his thoughts on the future of the happiness movement. He gave me four points. When I'm asked to talk about happiness and well-being here at the UN or elsewhere, there are generally four points I try to make on this, especially when I'm talking to people who are somewhat skeptical about this science, this new science. Um, first of all, yes, we can measure happiness. Very simple to measure in principle, you simply ask people. It might take people an hour and a half to write a good answer a good survey about their income and expenditure, but happiness is 20 seconds. So in principle it's very simple to, to measure. And as we're getting better, as this science is developing, we're getting much better at developing accurate measures that are robust. Uh, measures of evaluative measures of happiness, how happy are you with life overall, that's a very robust measure it seems across cultures. And people, when they're answering a survey, they, they get this, they can distinguish between how happy are you now and how happy are you overall. So the measurement side, I think we can measure it, we can measure it well. Second, happiness is really important. One of the reasons why, undoubtedly, why GDP has had the spotlight for the last 60 years as the dominant measure of progress for a society is it's just one number. GDP up, good. GDP down, bad. So we really need one number to challenge GDP. Now we can measure great, many different one numbers, but many of the ones currently used, like the genuine progress indicator, um, are really comprised of adding different things together and putting weights on them, which are quite arbitrary. And they can create a lot of discussion, especially among statisticians like me, that generate a lot of heat, but not very much light. Um, why are you valuing health the same as education? Who says that's right? And there's no way to answer those questions. Happiness cuts through all that. It's a straight, single answer to a single question. You can't argue about the weights or anything like that. So it's one number. Happiness up is good, undoubtedly. Happiness down is bad, undoubtedly. So it's interpretable. But it's also a Trojan horse for all of the other data uh, on well-being that you can think of. We ask a question on happiness, it can trigger a conversation in society. Why is it that women over 65 were less happy this week than last week? Is it because of the cuts in the healthcare budget? Is it because of you know, X, Y, and Z? So it's a way to have that richer, more important conversation about where we're that goes beyond money. The media love it, people get it, it resonates. So I think second, it's very important in this challenge to dethrone GDP. Third, I think this stuff's really important for policy making. Um, clearly, if you're a policymaker trying to influence someone, you need to understand how people feel, because it's usually how you feel in the moment or how you perceive the facts that govern our behaviour. So that kind of behavioural, you know, economic stuff is becoming really important um, in countries like the UK with their nudge unit, where they're finding some small tweaks that can really make things more effectively. Happiness does have a strong influence on many other aspects of life, more objective aspects of life, and a clear example is health, where. I think most doctors would tell you that a lot of illness is fought in the mind and emotion must have an impact. But when we see more and more evidence showing that happier people live longer, they recover more quickly in hospital, then governments can start to think, well, hang on, what does this mean? Maybe we should spend a little less on doctors and hospitals and a little bit more on community programmes that get people to spend time with their neighbours because that actually might have a better bang for your health dollar. It's just a more sensible, joined up way to think about the world. So. A lot of work's being done on this, and as more and more data now is collected by government and is used, is given to policymakers, a thousand flowers will bloom, and we're going to see so many more policies. I think innovative things that I can't even dream of will start happening. And fourth, for someone like me who's interested in looking at how countries develop and progress over time, looking at development through a happiness lens gives a second eye, binocular vision, to the measures we might normally use, and it gives us an extra depth. It gives us more perspective. Just like having two eyes is better than one. And it allows us to spot um, strange, strange things, uh, deviations from the norm. So whilst happiness and human development measured in terms of health or education are very strongly correlated, it's not always the case. And it's where there isn't that correlation. I think that there's very fertile ground for more research. And the classic example is Egypt uh, coming into the Arab Spring, where if you look at the key measures of development as measured normally, like income and so on, they are tracking up over time, life seems to be getting better. But if you look at how people feel and their answers to questions about how happy are you, they sudden, sudden decline just before the Arab Spring. So people could feel a problem even when the objective data didn't show it. Now, if policymakers aren't interested in that, then I'd say they're crazy. This is really, really important. So we need both of these lenses to look at the world to get a proper understanding of what's really happening. 
Happiness really is important. Join us May 29th and 30th for a happiness conference, the first to connect personal happiness with social change. And stay the weekend for fantastic trainings. Você não compreendeu a minha dor.